Are you a member of Unfound's discussion group on Facebook? If not, why not go over there and become a member right now? Ricky Jean Bryant, Jeannie to her family, was a four-year-old from Mauston, Wisconsin. She had an older brother and sister and two younger sisters. On December 19th, 1949, a fire broke out at the Bryant home. When the smoke cleared, Jeannie could not be found. She was never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. Given the format of this podcast, with us covering a lot of decades-old cases, I have to often rely on people who were very young, and sometimes not even born at the times of the disappearances, to pass along to you what they have learned secondhand, thirdhand, and even fourthhand, from their parents and even grandparents. And there is no doubt that in the process, facts can get misconstrued, left out, twisted, not because of any sort of conspiracy or scheme, but simply because the human brain ain't perfect. Still, I think these kids have done great jobs appearing on Unfound. For example, Kimber Biggs, sister of Mikhail Biggs, Christine Swaddell, sister of Sue Swaddell, Chris Allen, brother of Mark Allen. And there are many, many more. Well, with the disappearance of Jeannie Bryant, we have to rely on 75-year-old testimony of two kids who are now deceased to determine what is the truth and what is not. What are we to make of their children's stories? And now a summary of the case. This is brought to you by my friend Megan Lyonez's website, charlieproject.org. Jeannie Bryant was only four when she disappeared, so there isn't a lot to say about her. So instead, I will tell you about her family. Jeannie's father was a truck driver who spent a lot of time away from home. Jeannie's mother, Opal, had a full-time job working in downtown Mauston. Under the Bryant roof lived Jeannie, her nine-year-old sister, her five-year-old brother, and an 18-month-old sister, and she would have another sister that would come along in the 1950s. And all of these children were watched over by Opal's parents, who also lived in the house. This seems to have been the arrangement for a long time, and there's no record of anything unusual happening until the day of the disappearance. So, on December 19th, 1949, just six days before Christmas, The nine-year-old was at school, and the rest of the kids were at home with the grandparents. Around 2 p.m., a fire broke out in the house, the cause of which to this day is unknown. Everyone, including the grandfather who was handicapped, escaped the house. However, once everyone on the scene could collect themselves, they noticed that Jeannie was not there. She was never seen again. The recollection of the grandmother and the five-year-old brother started to diverge very quickly. With the older woman telling a neighbor that Jeannie had not been in the house at the time, while the son told people that Jeannie had been in the house and had gone out into the yard with himself, only to disappear after a pretty woman in a car pulled up to the property. Despite the son and grandmother living for many years after, the two tales were never resolved. We would never naturally think that grandparents and parents would cover up the death of a child. Yet, family members are statistically most likely to harm their youngest members. Contemplate if this is relevant to Jeannie's disappearance while you also try to answer these three questions during the interview. Number one, this could not have been a planned fire with a woman pulling up in the car as part of the scheme right? Number two, 
Could the five-year-old story simply be a coping mechanism to deal with the trauma he suffered while thinking Jeannie died in the fire? And number three, grandparents and grandchildren are usually very close. How could the five-year-old and grandmother not resolve their stories once he got older? Over time, Jeannie's siblings began to suspect that their mother and the grandparents knew exactly what happened to Jeannie and covered it up. The guest for this episode is blogger and podcaster Heather Grotman. Unfound News I had a conversation with a touring and talent management company this past week. They produce true crime shows with speakers that go around to venues talking about their topics of expertise. Who knows? Maybe I'll be in your city soon. Next, we had another death in the unfound family. Bruce Ricketts, the guest for the Pickering Six episode, died suddenly back in December of 2023. His family has unfound's deepest sympathies, and I hope somebody will continue Bruce's great work. Finally, I'm back in Florida, and it is so good to be back. I'm so happy to have on for, what What do we say, Heather, the sixth time? This sixth. is the sixth, mm-hmm. sixth time on Unfound, blogger and now podcaster, Surprise. Heather Grotman. Heather, <laughs> welcome to Unfound. Thank you, Ed. It's always an honor to be here and to talk with you. Yeah, welcome back. And I want everybody to know that after we're done talking about today's disappearance, we're going to get into Heather. Of course, she was a blogger for all these years, and now she's got into the crazy world of podcasting. And uh, when we're done here, I, I certainly want to uh, probe her mind as to what, uh, why she uh, did that and how's it go- how it is going for her. But we'll talk about the disappearance first. Of course, we have a lot to talk about. But how have you been, Heather? It's been, um, you know, I was thinking, man, it's been almost a year. I was like, I think it's uh, time to have Heather back on. What's the last year been like for you just in general? How's your life going and everything? It's going well. Um, My mother passed away last month, which was terrible. But on an up note, I'm going to be a grandma for the first time. Wow. The end of the summer. Yeah. Wow. Look at you. Mm Mm-hmm. Grandma Heather, that is spectacular. Yeah. All right. This will be your first grandchild. Yes. Yes. Okay. A little great. boy. We we think it's a little boy. So. Yeah. And what's what's approximately the due date at this point? Do we the know? end of August. The end of August. So the kid's yeah. going to be a, a Virgo. Oh, yeah. That, that if you're into, I'm not really into that, but I just, I'm born August 1st. That's a Leo. And I just know Virgos come after yeah. Leo. So, okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, my uh, brother, Brian, uh, birthday is September 2nd. So maybe if it holds out for a couple days, the the, <laughs> the young boy will uh, have the same birthday as my brother, Brian. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, congratulations to you. Well, thank you. Lots going on for Heather. And of course, we're all sorry to hear about the passing of your mother. And thank uh, you. of course, that. I knew about that. I've experienced that myself. All right, we got, uh, you know, the thing that I was saying about you, Heather, before we started is, of course, you've brought what we've uh, to unfound over the past, what, five years now, six years, some very, uh, some disappearances that, you know, may be common for the kind that we cover, you know, Christy Nichols, you know, her husband says she kind of took off or something happened, Nyleen Marshall up there in Montana, did she walk off, did she get snatched by somebody? But on the other hand, you've brought to Unfound some of the most unique disappearances that we've covered. We have, of course, Dale Kerstetter. We have Dub and Chance Wackerhagen. And then, of course, we went the whole way to Wales uh, a year ago with Trevelyn Evans. So we appreciate you kind of giving us uh, some putting some disappearances into Unfound's catalog that maybe myself and my assistants don't run across on a daily basis. Today is kind of the same thing for the disappearance of Ricky Jean Bryant, a Ricky uh, was a girl though. Yeah, and they called her Jeannie, so I'll just refer to her as Jeannie. Very good, Jeannie. All right, so first of all, when did you first hear about this disappearance? Was it right around the time you were looking for for something to write about or do on your podcast, or was it years ago? How did that all happen? 
it was probably just a couple of years ago. And, and I'm all, always trying to find rare cases because, you know, some of them have been covered enough. I don't need to cover them. That's yeah. how I feel. But I was looking at, I believe it was the Doe Network. They have featured cases every month. And I remember it said missing from a house fire. And I thought, what? Because that's something you don't hear every day. Mm -hmm. So then I did, you know, I dug a little bit and there was enough to write about. Some cases are great, but there just isn't enough to write an article about. There's yeah. not enough information out there. Yeah, right. And we run into that. Of course, we also we do we'll talk to anybody, as everybody knows, I'll talk to anybody. It's probably easier to make an hour, hour and a half long podcast without a lot of facts and contrast if you're just going to be writing about it. It's, yeah. you know, to put all those words together and maybe you have a standard, well, I want to write at least 3,000 words or maybe you have some sort of standard that you, that, you know, you want to reach. So that can be tough sometimes for sure. Yeah, I want people to finish reading an article and go, what? You know, yeah. I don't want it there to be a clear cut what probably happened. I like it when there's, you know, there's twists and turns to write about. Right. That's right. And you certainly provided that for Unfound, like I said before. Uh, when you came across it, as I stated uh, before we started, I really didn't know the name, but as soon as there was this element that we're going to get into about a pretty woman pulling up in a car and possibly taking Jeannie, we're going to get into all this in a moment. I was like, oh yeah, I've heard of this before. Was it the kind of the same thing for you or had you not heard of this disappearance before? No, I mean, I don't think I'd ever heard of a case where a child went missing when their house was burned down. Okay. okay. I mean, technically missing. Right. Yeah. And uh, maybe you don't know this and that's totally fine. It's not your podcast. It's mine, but we have covered um, Gerald Rustness and I'm going to have to look up his uh, wife's name at the time, just for a moment, Gerald Rustness and his wife who went missing, but their son was found deceased in um in their house that would be peggy mckay and Ger uh bernard rustness excuse me bernard rustness and peggy mckay who went missing their son was found in a burned down house uh many many years ago back in the 1970s so we maybe have a little bit of experience uh with mm -hmm. this and maybe we'll get to compare and contrast that later so let's just get right into this um you know so this is a unique one that's why you chose uh mm -hmm. to cover it and let's just go where you want to start the bryant family where would you like to start talking about it they lived in an old farmhouse near mauston wisconsin and opal and raymond were the parents they lived there with i think it's the the mother's parents casper and helen halverson okay and they had four children wow and this this was just a typical Monday morning. It was like a week before Christmas. And the oldest um, daughter, Sharon, was nine. She was at school. Okay. And Raymond was a truck driver. He was, I think, around Chicago that day driving. And the mother, Opal, worked at a garment factory in town. And the grandparents, well, the grandmother looked after the children. The mm -hmm. grandfather was in poor health. He was an invalid, they referred to him. Wow. Okay, so we have four kids, one at school, and then the other three, uh, not even close to nine years. So it's like what a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and like an infant, and then an eighteen-month-old. Yeah. Wow. All right. So they have four, one uh, nine-year-old, and then three others. Okay, please. Can so the parents are out working. Grandparents are essentially babysitting the kids. I guess but they're all living together. And as far as pinpointing the time, about two p.m., a neighbor drove by everything seemed fine and then like less than an hour later there's smoke so they say at 3 p.m on monday there's this horrible house fire mm. but there's like hardly any information about the house fire there's and we still don't know to this day the cause or any okay. even any speculation of the cause but it, you know it was winter in wisconsin so I'm sure they had some kind of heat going on right we have to remember this is uh not long before christmas tragically yeah uh so yeah it might have been snow very cold very un uncomfortable and so this fire gets started and what you're saying here in 2024 still still no word on this no i even reached out to the detective and he said well he didn't even know 
Okay. Yeah, maybe it's in the original file. Okay, very good. So we have this fire and what goes on? Of course, um, there's a variety of different stories. This is going to be a little difficult Which story do you want me to uh, tell you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to, to navigate here. We're going to do our best with it. But so this is there's this fire and let's just put it this way. What was the officially as best as you can tell? Of course, neither of us were around. We weren't even close to being born at the time. But was the yeah. official accepted story as what transpired after this fire started? Who noticed it? How did they get everybody out? Et cetera. See, I'm not even sure. I mean, you could hear two versions at first, and then it's like as time went on, they there was just one version. Now, the little boy, his name was Forrest. He was five. His version's a lot more compelling than the grandma's. But let me just say the grandma's version is that Forrest and Elizabeth, they were five and two. She got them out of the house. She went back in to try to find Jeannie. Okay. And she couldn't. So now, Ed, you, lo you love this next part. She's <laughs> 70 years old. She goes upstairs and grabs her invalid 80-year-old husband and carries him down rickety ladder to safety by what the newspaper account says. Superwoman. And it, and it's everywhere. It's even like headlines. That okay. was the big exciting part of the story, I guess. Okay. okay. So then it's like, okay, where's Jeannie? And, you know, the, the, there were, I think they were all volunteer firemen, you know, so it right. probably took them a little bit to get there. And one of them claimed they heard scream, her screaming in the building. Of course, wow. think of the chaos. A lot of people could have been screaming. Yeah, he, for sure. They claim that they heard screams in the fire as they were battling the blaze. Okay. We don't know if it's screams. Of course, houses, buildings make unusual sounds when they that uh when they are burning. Uh and it may sound like a human scream, but we have to be open to the idea that maybe it was something else. Maybe. Uh and you know, air being released yeah. somehow or something like that. Or even, I mean, we don't know if there was pets inside. I mean, you know, yeah. you can't say, oh, well, that must have been her scream coming from this house. It was so chaotic. Right. But I will say that the nine-year-old, she was down the road. I'm not sure how far away at school. And she could actually see the smoke and see some of it from her window. And she claimed the teacher had to just make her stay in her seat because she wanted to hurry and check on her family. Can you imagine right. nine and watching your family's house yeah. burn to the ground? Right. All right. So we have this grand uh, grandmother. Fire gets started. Grandmother, though, I guess never says how the fire started. Correct. No, no, that's no, what's no crazy. No, nobody even says. And and that's why it was important. It's three o'clock in the afternoon, in the winter. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have to remember that the parents are gone, nowhere near there, seemingly one in town, one on the road driving a truck, and the nine-year-old's at school. Okay, and so they get out, and the firemen show up, and everybody is outside except for Jeannie. Right. Okay. What do we know about the fire? Did it take a long time to put out? Uh, do we know? It's really, it's so vague. It just says they battled the blaze and Tuesday. And I think Wednesday was the latest I could find where they just said, well, you know, they couldn't find Jeannie inside, mm -hmm. but okay. they, they found it. I mean, but there would have been quite a bit of daylight hours still, right? You know, cause you kind of picture it being dark at night, but you know, and it would have gotten dark early in December. For sure. Too, Especially but. in the Northern hemisphere up near Wisconsin. They came out pretty quickly. They came out with a couple of bone fragments and they sent those off and pretty quickly it came back. They, all they really said was they weren't human. So that was not Jeannie. Okay. Well, they might've had uh, some pets or maybe they had a, a rat or a mouse or something living in there that got, or a cat, you know, stray yeah. cat or something, always possible. So we have this situation, Jeannie's missing. And the ki other kids, uh, the other two kids that were at home, like you said, an 18 month old, and then this uh, boy, they were taken out by the grandmother. Grandma somehow gets the grandfather out of there. And seemingly, Jeannie seemingly dies in the fire, except remains not found in the fire. Right. And 
I did see that Jeannie, just for reference, weighed about 40 pounds. Okay. And she was only a few, you know, about probably about three mm-hmm. feet tall. She had just turned four like the month before that. Okay. Now, once again, uh, just to ask some, we just, because I'm sure people are listening, maybe some already some questions going through listeners' minds. This is just an example, of course. I don't know. It. If you don't know it, Heather, totally fine. Of course, we have to remember this is uh, 75 years ago now. What did, did the grandmother or grandfather ever count where they last saw Jeannie in the house before the fire started? Did, did that, has that ever come up? No, not that she specifically said there was, they were more speculating that there must have been a closet under the stairs and they thought, well, maybe the kids were playing in that closet and then Jeannie ran and was on the stairs when they collapsed. But why can't they find her on the, I mean, especially if they know a specific place to look. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, and I have a question here. Uh, the initial reaction, so what did the family think happened that Jeannie died in the fire? Would you say that was the initial yeah. reaction? Yeah, and that's okay. what all the headlines, child perishes in fire. Okay, and it, you're also giving me the impression that Jeannie was noticed to be missing fairly quickly. So they get everybody out, and it's like, where's Jeannie? Yeah, and some people thought maybe she got scared and she ran away, but I guess she just never turned up, so they assumed it was she was in the fire. Okay. So the grandmother's not taking credit for scooting Jeannie out or anything else. Yeah. At least at the time, we're going to get to this alternative story told Where by her the... Herculean strength. You yeah. think she could have got a four-year-old out of there. You'd think, uh, but we're going to get to the boy's story here a little, in a, in a little bit. So, and of course, in a situation like this, we know that adult stories are going to take precedent over children's stories. We, we, you know, that's common, but um, so any, were any searches done to any news that you could find any searches done thinking, well, maybe she did run off any searches done in the area, any bodies of water, anything like that? No, that's a great question. The only thing they talked about was searching the remains of the fire. Okay. So she, uh, the grandmother says, nope, I didn't get Jeannie out of there. I think that she died in the fire. Uh, but on the other hand, it doesn't seem like anybody, even the kids, of course, an 18-month-year-old isn't going to be able to say much, but the son never says, well, I last saw Jeannie in the house here. Yeah, and I, I mean, I don't even know if the grandma was specific about Jeannie. She just kind of mm-hmm. said, I got the kids out, you know. It's, okay. The only thing that's different between the the grandma and the, the little boy's version is, mm-hmm. Jean, is about Jeannie. Right, and we're, we're, this is... It's going to be interesting because uh, once again, as the listeners know, when I have somebody on like Heather, we do a lot more theorizing. Like when I had Joe Kistner on at one point to talk about Bernard Russiness and Peggy McKay or Milton McQuillan, we do a little more theorizing, which we're going to get to here in a bit more than I would ever do with a family member for obvious reasons. All right. So we don't know the cause of the fire. Uh, We don't know how it was put out. Uh, As far as you can tell regarding the house, was it like totally burned to the ground? I think I did see a picture in some news article from back then. Was well, it like half gone or what do you remember? No, there's there's no pictures. I think the picture you saw, if you look at the caption, I think it was the school that Sharon oh. was in. Maybe that was the only picture they had available. But I would have loved to seen a picture. They did say that this was on like a farm, but the wind was in their favor. So no other buildings were affected on the property. But yeah, it was a complete loss. And one place said even the basement, you know, things in the basement were damaged, but I'm assuming everything fell into the basement. Right. It eventually collapsed in and we have to 1949. It might've been a house that was built in the 1800s, you know, yeah. and so it's going to, it's going to go up. Uh, pretty yeah. Fast. One, place, one place said that the fire was so intense that it melted the metal structure. All right. So that's pretty hot. So, Mm-hmm. We'll come back to that uh, later. Um, inside the house, anything salvageable? I have some questions and just in articles being that you, you know, did all the research for this. Any of Jeannie's things found I, or anything like any toys? I guess all that stuff would have been burned, right? No, and these are just articles. So they just kind of tell you the main facts. But, you know, we'll talk about the third version of the story. There could have been a few things saved. <laughs> okay. All right, so, but bones found, not genies. We already went through that. 
Um, do we have any idea what the that animal or animals might have been? Any any? No, and it was just I think it was two small bone fragments, and they just came back and said they weren't theirs. Of course, no DNA back then, so I'm sure they could just tell that it wasn't a human. Okay. Now here we have to remember this happened not long before Christmas, less than a week before Christmas. And, you know, the, the, I think my impression, of course, correct me if I'm wrong, from reading what you've written was that maybe not at the time, maybe they were too young to really appreciate what was going on. But at some point in their adult lives, these other children started to really wonder what's going on here. But and maybe this is part of the reason. Explain the Christmas. They described that Christmas of 1949, which only would have been six days later. Explain it. Well, I first will say that um, Sharon, the girl at school, I guess her mom came to pick her up that day. And she basically told her, Jeannie's an angel. You know, I don't want you talking about her anymore. Mm -hmm. But they did say they were allowed at Christmas. They put an angel on the tree that was supposed to, I guess, symbolize Jeannie. But after that, they weren't supposed to talk about her anymore. That's that's what she said uh, and when she got to be an adult. That's the way she remembers it. Yeah. Okay. So Jeannie, of course, is still missing. That's why Heather is appearing today. But six days later, her remains have not been found in the house or anywhere else. And already they're saying she's deceased. Right. Okay. All right. So this is, and what is your impression? Did they move somewhere else? Did they stay in Boston? Do we know where they went? That's a good question. First, I want to tell you that the father, they said that he was on his hands and knees and he searched that house three times. He was so devastated and he doesn't believe she was in there because he looked himself and he couldn't find okay. her remains. But the question I'm not now, there was an article that um, a neighbor said, OK, you can stay in my house. You know, I'm, I'm I guess he went south for the winter and he still wasn't there yet. But I, when I looked up um, Casper Halverson, he was the 80-year-old that was, you know, had some significant injuries for the fire. He actually died May of the next year. But right. in his obituary, it said that he lived with Raymond and Opal Bryant and had for several years at, at their home, okay. which was kind of curious, but maybe they just meant he lived with them. Okay. I mean, they, I don't think they would have rebuilt is what I'm saying. Right. Okay. Do we know where the the Bryants went after this? Did they build a new house? Did they do we, do we any no, just that old house. records like ancestry.com anything like that to track down did they stay in Boston? Did they stay in Wisconsin? Any anything? Like um I think while they were still together it seems like, you know, as far as I know they stayed there for a while. Okay. All right. So they had to go live somewhere. So the father seemingly uh, out of town comes back in devastated. No surprise there, but my impression is that the mother maybe had a little bit different reaction to this, like kind of maybe if we're to believe the other children kind of wanted to just make it all go away. Yeah, the mother and the grandmother are the reason this case is even, you know, made it this far. Okay. okay. Because it's not hard to understand where they're coming from. Because of their actions and words. Right. And we have to remember your belief is that it would make sense. The grandparents that were living with them was were Opal's grandparents. I believe they were Opal's parents, yes. Okay. All right. So now we're going to kind of go up, kind of go forward a little bit and then go back. But at some point in their lives, these children became adults. And it seems they really started to question the official story that Jeannie died in the fire and everybody's just starting to go on with their lives. What, what's your impression uh, of why they started to do this? You know, why it maybe took a while? Well, I think it was like 1985. They were just kind of comparing mm -hmm. notes and probably, you know, talking about their sister. Mm -hmm. But then as years went on, they kind of started to, you know, question things and, and got a hold of a relative that we can talk about later if you want. Okay. That really, really caught their interest as well. But she had. Right. All right. So 85. So we're talking like roughly 35 years later. Of course, they become mm -hmm. teenagers, do whatever with their lives. And, you know, why we're not sure, of course, uh, we're not sure why it suddenly kicked in in the 1980s and not the 70s or the 60s, but that's just the way that's what their story is. 
-hmm. and they co started comparing notes and saying you know what there's something about this official story that genie died in this fire that isn't doesn't quite seem right yeah and i'm not sure what year but they said the mother actually um got a headstone for genie mm -hmm. and tried to get her her kids to go visit and tell her goodbye but they just couldn't bring themselves to do it which is kind of a strange thing for her on her own to do and it just said many years later okay and your, your impression, what did they do? Did they go to the, the police and, uh, you know, uh, how um, how deep were they into this? Did they go to the police regarding all of this or they started doing their work on their own? What can you tell? That's a good question. I'm not sure how it, you know, chronologically how it came about, but I'm sure they probably contacted them. You know, has there been any developments? You know, because the strange thing was there was a, a missing persons case but they did say there was never any death certificate and they never had a funeral for Jeannie. i mean if they're convinced she died in the fire why wouldn't they have a funeral for her? all right so there's a headstone for but no death certificate yeah no funeral yeah that is weird uh did opal and her husband stay married after this did they grow old together or what did they do no, yeah. I think they got divorced about 10 years later. They did. And I was telling you, I just found out yesterday on the Find a Grave website, they actually had another child in right. 1954, I believe. So four years after Jeannie went missing. Wow. And her name was Sandria Bryant. And then she passed away a few years ago. Oh, my. Okay, so she wasn't even that old. She wasn't the even obituary, 70. The obituary didn't specifically mention opal and raymond but they did say that she had siblings preceded her in death with sharon and it, it said ricky jean bryant was it a did. sibling preceded her in death yes okay all right so we have another child who of course would not have known anything the only thing she would even know about is what her older much older siblings would have been able to tell her you know she wasn't around at the time so even if she were alive today i don't know how much help she uh could have yeah. been but now we'll go to this. Of course, I have it in the outline, two hugely different stories, but you're telling me there might be three. So we've already gotten one of those stories. The 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 grandmother says, yeah, I got a couple kids out, couldn't find Jeannie inside, and she must have died in the fire. What is the other story? And I guess this comes from the young son. What's the second story? Yeah, For Forrest was five, and he said that him and Elizabeth and Jeannie were all out in the yard. And then he said a tall blonde lady in a fancy car pulled up and told him to get help at the neighbors but he says that she said don't go to the close neighbor because their phone's not working go to this neighbor down the road so he ran down to the neighbor that's going to be we're going to talk about her mm -hmm. version yeah. soon yes and yes. when he came right. back he said that Jeannie was gone but elizabeth was still 18 month old still out there in the yard 18 month old just left by herself yeah grabbed just... a four-year-old but left 18 month old there and you know grandma can't even dispute this story i was thinking because she's inside rescuing her husband right that's right and the grandmother what year how long after this maybe i should ask you this how long after this did she die we know the grandfather died the next year do we have any idea that she could yeah, according to Find a Grave, 1979 is when she passed. Wow, she lived for 30, uh, 30 more years. The yeah, and you know what? One account said she was 59 years old, but there's a few other accounts that said she was 70. She lived to be 100. But that's, I mean, that's just what Find a Grave. I don't know. That's right, right. Sure. Okay. All right. So the, her, her husband, uh, who is invalid, dies in 50. She lives for another 29 years. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, well, if she was, oh, that's hard to figure. All right. But sticking with the story, the way Forrest remembers it, all three kids were out there in the yard. Woman pulls up in a fancy car, quote unquote, yeah. tells him to go down the road, a five year old, to run down the road. And then when he comes back, it's just the 18 month old by herself, just sitting there in the mm -hmm. yard while this raging fire is going on. Yeah, and some versions don't even mention where she said their phone's not working. Some versions just said he was directed to go down the road, not to the closest neighbor. Okay. All right. 
um, as best as you can tell. When did this alternative story regarding for I guess Forrest's story uh, start to become like a, a public thing? Was it? I'm guessing it wasn't until like the 1980s. Or no, no, this you know. this story came out right away. He always it did. Yeah. All right. So what you're saying is, so the grandmother has one story. It's like the grandmother's story versus the five-year-old story. Yes. Wow. And normally you would believe the grandmother, but. Um... Of course. And what is the third story? You said there's this other third story. Maybe we need to put that in here right now, like an alternative. Well, the, it's the neighbor's version. And that's, that's where Forrest ran to her house. And so she ran and she was frantic. She ran into the house and she wanted to help, you know, find, yeah. find Jeannie, I guess, or just see what she could do to help. She said the grandmother was in there gathering canned goods. And when she mentioned Jeannie, the grandma said, you know, the child is fine. She's with relatives. And then she asked the neighbor, hey, will you grab my fur coat? So there's priorities for you. Go get my fur coat. <laughs> yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, that's something. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we know sometimes people say strange things. And this is uh, you and I both know about eyewitness accounts. I guess we have to take it as true. But we also have to remember that neither of us were there. But it certainly that does certainly seem odd. I guess what we're also saying, though, is that this uh, woman's name was Irene, correct? Irene, I believe so, yes. Irene. Mm -hmm. So she shows up and obviously didn't see Jeannie in the yard. See, I'm not sure if she just ran in there to help, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's a good point. Maybe she, she didn't see Jeannie in the yard. Okay. So she but, I mean, in... was Jeannie taken or, you know, either version would account for that, I guess. Right. Okay. So we have the, uh, your impression of this area of Mostyn, Illinois, is this kind of an area, best as you can tell, where people were driving? I don't know what fancy cars had a Cadillac. I mean, I, you yeah. know, like, you yeah, know, it was probably just a big car. Right. But this, uh, was in, this was in Wisconsin. And I think it was a little bit in the country. It was like three miles from Mostyn. Mm -hmm. All right. So your impression that the, what this forest at five years old is saying, it's, this woman just happened to pull up after this fire started. Is that yeah. is that what he was saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, there was a theory that if she were if she were working with someone, you know, they could have started the fire, and then there she was. Right, and we're gonna, like I said, we'll do us. So we're allowed to do speculation. We have uh, bloggers and podcasters on, so we don't mind doing that. In contrast to when family members on, for once again, I've stated these reasons over and over and over. So we could be, if we really wanted to get go to conspiracy land on this, is that this was all timed somehow. That yeah, somebody could have started the fire. And then some of this is all kind of a plan to snatch Jeannie for some reason. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now we have, you know, the interesting thing is uh, we I talked about Joe Rustness and Peggy McKay. We've also covered another disappearance kind of like this. And that was um, David Heimbaugh, who went missing from New Jersey, who went missing after running out of his house to check out a brush fire. And it has been alleged uh, by the guy who continues to work on it, Rich McHale, who was on Unfound, that um, that he got uh, uh, kidnapped during the process of this. And maybe this fire was once again a way to get him out of the house so as to kidnap him. So this is kind of the same feeling that I get with this. Could the, the fire, I mean, a house much more dangerous than a brush fire, maybe kind of the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you've done, obviously, you've been doing this for a while. Any other maybe situations you can compare to this? Any other disappearances that come to mind where somebody might have done something like this to distract people or anything that... The... Not in, on that on that end, but I did do the one. Um, it was in Oklahoma where the, the Christmas tree, you know, lit up an inferno on Christmas Eve. And all these people were killed. And there's a little, little tiny girl that's unaccounted for. You know, there was speculation what happened to her. But I believe that she just, you know, burned in the fire. 
All right. So that so in that one, you're going more toward I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with that disappearance. You're going more toward the idea that, yes, she did. Yeah, because it was a small um, it was people were packed in this tiny one room schoolhouse back when they had candles on Christmas trees. This, oh this poor teenagers playing Santa, his beard catches fire. It's a complete inferno and all the, the lead based paint everywhere. Mm -hmm. The windows were stuck. I mean, people were just trapped in there to burn up and her being the tiniest one. I just think that there really weren't any remains to find probably. Right. And I guess what we're saying about Heather here is she's not, uh, you know, she doesn't automatically default to a particular idea. She's looking at the facts. She's looking at this disappearance and being a very open idea. Maybe Jeannie wasn't in the house at all. Whereas this other one, you, you, you know, very well, you look at the facts and say, most likely this uh, little girl was in the fire, you know, yeah. so you're not defaulting to the, like the craziest, uh, conspiracy yeah. just for the heck of it. You know, you're, yeah. you're trying to be very objective about this. Very good. Interesting. Now, uh, you already met, kind of mentioned this before, but we're going to go through it again. And I even have it in my notes. She who shall not be named kind of like Lord Voldemort. Um, Jeannie's name was never to be mentioned. That's what these other children said. Yeah. And Sharon said the day of the fire, her mother was adamant about that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and people deal with grief differently, but that it doesn't make any sense. You know, your yeah. children are grieving also. That's true. And Unfound exists for the last seven and a half years because parents often do want to talk about their missing children, no matter if they're five year old or 25 or 45. You know, they want to talk. So it, that does seem to make more sense than telling everybody, you know. The, the mother and grandmother just accepted it immediately without questioning. I mean, the father was acting more like a normal father would, looking himself, trying to find any mm -hmm. remains of her. Can you find anything? It's a good point. Um, did the father, who seems to be disconnected from this, like I said, we're going to theorize more than we usually do, but if this was something between the mother and her mother, the grandmother, it doesn't seem like the father was involved in this. Did the father talk much about this after they got divorced, maybe felt free, uh, anything like that? Have the children ever come forward to say conversations that they had with their father, like, you know, dad, we don't think that the fire story really checks out anything like that. Well, the only thing that they said that their father went to his grave, believing that Jeannie was not in the fire, not in the house that day. Wow. That's the only mention. There's never any interviews with him or any quotes from him. Okay. All right. Very good. So I guess then we'd say, if we're going to pick a couple, one of the two stories, the father's more going along with what Forrest said and not with what the grandmother said. Yeah, because Forrest was young, but then you think what a traumatic day that was. Right. And his story has not changed once. Not once. Okay. So the grandmother acted weird, collecting uh, canned goods, the fur coat story for her to believe this woman, Irene. And coincidentally, this Irene is also the place where Forrest ran to, right? I believe so, because I think she came back with Forrest is what she was saying. So I'm assuming that was where he went. Okay. All right, so we got, uh, of course, people do die in fires. Uh, even with Gerald Rustness and Peggy McKay, I am on the record, at least at the Patreon blog, to writing, I believe they did die in that fire. And mm -hmm. their son, of course, we, they found his the son's remains, and they're very sad. Um, whereas there are some other disappearances where I'm not so sure that happened. So I really, maybe I'm like you, Heather, kind of just really have to take a look at things. Uh, very another case, I'm sorry, would be the Sauter children, right? That's right. We're more than one, right? More than five. one, yes, like five. Five children I mean, disappeared, like in half, fire. half the kids got out, and then half were still in the house, right? And the listeners should know, I we've tried to cover the disappearance one time, and in fact, one of the children did get back to me, but she did not want to be interviewed because she thinks it's just become like a spectacle at this point it's just a public interest type of thing and nobody really is interested yeah. in really trying to figure out what happened so I, I i want everybody out there to know i i tried my best uh but somebody did get back to me 
and I don't think we're ever going to be able to cover that disappearance. To move on to this, though, this isn't the only strange thing about this separate stories, this woman in a car and everything. Opal, the mother, this is something maybe the children noticed once they got older. Let's talk a little bit about her. She would uh, she would disappear for a while. What is this? Yeah, well, I mean, got divorced and she took Elizabeth with her. And the, I mean, the, this is the children's recollection. So that okay. helps her wait. Right. They, they said the mother even said, you, Forrest and Sharon can go with their father because they're more like him. Almost seemed like bitterness, you know, the way they were quoting what she would say. Yeah. It so, and I, I believed, and so they were living in Wisconsin, um, Forrest and Elizabeth. And I'm sorry. Yeah. And the mother would come to visit them. And she would take them to Minnesota and she would leave them with relatives in Minnesota for several days. And she would go somewhere and no one ever knew where she went. So this was after the divorce occurred. Yeah. So that now we're talking about kids that are in their team. Well, maybe not the, maybe not the 18 month old in, eight, in 1949, but let's just pick out a year 1961 after the divorce. We're now talking about, uh, nine-year-old, 12 years later, who would be 21. And then the other kids, um, you know, he'd be 17 or something. The other uh, daughter would be like 12. And the other, so the youngest ones are saying, yeah, I should just take off. Yeah. And no she'd be gone. So why would you come get your kids for a visit and you're going to bring them to somebody's house and dump them off and then go somewhere else? Okay. Do you any uh, any uh, proof that they ever said anything to their father about this? Hey, mom's taken us for time, but then when I'm, we're supposed to be there, she's not even watching us. No, it's another good question. The article's just yeah. focused on Jeannie. Yeah. yeah, okay. And who would she leave these people with? With the grandmother who was still alive or? They never said it, just said relatives. In, in Minnesota. And I assume, yeah, in Minnesota. Okay. So she had some place to be or someone to meet in Minnesota, Opal did. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't, this really just adds to it, doesn't it? Even though this is many years after the disappearance, uh, as, as you know, Heather, every person's decisions and words starts to get nitpicked apart. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Everything, suddenly everything becomes suspicious because we don't have an explanation. Suddenly every particular thing uh, gets really scrutinized. Yeah. Okay. Now there was a rumor. So why don't you talk about this rumor regarding Jeannie? Maybe she was not biologically the father's. Where, when did this come up? How did it come up? I'm not sure if it, when it first came up, but when they talked to, they found Opal's second cousin that I believe she was close with at one point. And, but so I don't know whether all along there was some speculation that maybe that wasn't his biological child. But mm -hmm. if you want to talk about Lois, I mean, that's that's who really opened the door for the kids. Okay. And she said that um, she that Opal was having an affair. And they said she even saw a man in the photo albums mm -hmm. that Lois kind of recognized as someone that Opal had had an affair with. And she said this man has a daughter that would be the same age as Jeannie would have been. But they did they did test her DNA right away and she was not Jeannie. But you know, Lois even said if if you do some digging, you're going to be surprised at what you find. Which was really a cryptic line that we don't really know why. Right. You know, but it seemed like Opal was pretty shady to say the least. And this is her cousin that was close with her was telling the kids this. Yeah, uh, right. She, you know, with this going away and not knowing where she was going, maybe she just had some job out of town, but you'd think that she would have told her yeah, kids so the about kids it. think those visits were to go see Jeannie. All right, so going to Minnesota and then getting dumped off, they were going to see Jeannie instead. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the problem is, of course, you've written about this. I know over the years, this disappearance has been covered a few different places. Obviously, there are news articles about it. People have dug into this, and it doesn't seem that Lois's words have come true, that nothing's really, nothing really concrete 
uh, has been found to be, to, yeah. you know. Yeah. And, and I don't know how long Lois and Opal were close, whether she was still close with her when she was married and having children. But I mean, she knew enough to know about the affair. She seemed to have specific information about at least one person. Okay. All right. She so she says, yeah, you never know what you're, you, you who knows what you'll find. Well, nothing's been found yeah. <laughs> except suspicion from the the kids yeah. who would have been suspicious no matter if she said anything or not. And I'm not sure when, but when they got divorced, I believe <clears> Opal <throat> took Elizabeth and moved to Washington State, and I believe she lived there until she died. Okay, so she went quite a ways away. Yeah. Okay. So she is dead um, and maybe has obviously been dead uh, for a while. Um, let's talk about the father. Did the father show to any any proof that he ever showed any strange behavior? Uh, of course, no, we know about Opal's behavior, anything regarding his behavior. No, there's no mention of anything but him just on his hands and knees searching the the rubble for his child okay all right getting back to the neighbor just a little bit uh this is irene um did forrest's and irene's stories check out are they what we might call congruent he runs to her house to tell her what's going on and you know she comes back you know did, well did... They, they only mention what she claimed once she got to the fire Okay. They didn't really talk. They just said that she came back with Forrest. All right. So that does down. check out then that Forrest really did go down there, five years old, and ran to his ho her house. Yeah. All right. So that wasn't And so I mean, sad. another way to explain away this, this lady, I was thinking, well, you know, maybe she was driving by. She sees a house on fire and little kids out in the yard. I mean, of course, she'll say, go get help. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I think I think you bring up a very good point here, Heather. Just because this woman pulled up into the yard and told him to go get help doesn't mean she snatched Jeannie. Yeah. Right? I mean, it, it logically it makes sense, but it very well could be that Jeannie ran back into the fire or something. Right. You know, right? I mean, it's possible. Right. It seems yeah. unlikely, but horses have been known run to running back into barns that are on fire as well. So. And she doesn't mm -hmm. totally understand, you know, fire is dangerous and you need to stay away from there. Yeah. Um, did, is there any proof that they ever tried to track this mysterious pretty woman down? Any searches, any call outs in any papers? If you were by that day, come forward, anything like that? No, but you know a big reason why that's, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, because they didn't want it. They didn't, they just totally no, put that thing out. No, I mean the police file. Oh, the police file. Right. Let's talk about that right now regarding the police file, because we're going to talk about the police because you've had some recent interaction with them. What about the police file? Well, the police file was destroyed around the year 2000 in a flood. So, I mean, literally everything is gone. And I did. I called Detective Sean Goyette a few days ago of the Juneau County Sheriff's Department, and he was telling me all these things. And it was literally what was in the newspaper articles because that's really all he has to go on now yeah so they they did write another missing persons report so they i think they have tried to rebuild the file as much as they can uh -huh. now i should have asked you very probably early on any of these children still alive uh one is still alive elizabeth i think the youngest one or the late 70s all right the one that was 18 months at the time so yeah, the next and, and Sean, Sean called her because I didn't know. I'm always kind of hesitant to reach out when they're older. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, they they get a little spooked. Yeah. And he said that she was she was kind of hesitant to even speak with him. You know, she just kind of made her peace and and just think about it, this has been her entire life. Yeah. This has been hanging over her head. This miss right. And we have to remember she was just 18 months at the time. She probably doesn't yeah. even remember the fire. Just, just has no recollection of it at all. Yeah. Whereas in contrast, if Forrest was still alive and still had his mind, then, you know, then we could really, uh, you know, could see, you know, match everything up and everything. All right. So unfortunately, only the 18 month old is alive now. Um, Your impression in talking to the police officer, just uh, did you get the idea, if you can say, 
Uh, if he also thought that the stories didn't quite match up, that he thought maybe something sinister, suspicious, or underhanded went on here. Well, I will say he was very nice. He was he he was very open to talking, and you never really know with what we do if the cops want to talk. He was very open, but in articles I've seen that he's mentioned that that I think he tends to think that she wasn't in the fire. But I, I emailed him later and I asked him if he ever found out the cause of the fire. And he said, no, maybe it was in the original file, but not that he's aware of. Okay. Don't know. Um, of course, a lot of things back then could have caused a fire. 1949, we don't quite have the um, the building codes and things that we have now. Like I said, that house might have been built in the 1800s where there were no building codes. So. We have to think that um, and maybe there was a Christmas tree that was dry. Maybe there were lights. There you I don't go. know. Christmas lights came around. There you go. And if they did, we're using some electric Christmas lights. Maybe they overloaded the circuitry in the house, which probably wasn't wired for electricity in the first place. It had to be put in there. A lot of different things are possible. Um, a lot of different possibilities. So we have these stories um and you have a five-year-old versus his grandmother it's that's yeah. pretty that's pretty unique right <laughs> and the five-year-olds ex explain you know it almost seems more credible just because the grandma has i mean she could have looked for genie a little bit longer than she did even by what her account yeah she's rescuing her husband her uh, 80 year old invalid does. husband I mean, I know a four year old down there and then who knows where. Right. I mean, 80 year olds need rescued too, but. Yeah. Okay. Let's do a little theory time. Of course, we've been theorizing uh, a little bit uh, anyway as we've been going here. So we come to this. Um, you know, what are the pluses and minuses you would say regarding a planned abduction? Well, that would make sense. If the lady, you know, someone could have started the fire and then just kind of hung around out front. But I mean, I would think that they were specifically looking for Jeannie, you know, because there were three kids out there and she could have taken all of them. You know, she could have said, I'll take you somewhere, you know, where it's safe. And they would have all climbed in. Right. And when, it, and when I guess we also have to think about, wouldn't it be easier to take the 18 month old? Yeah. Would not a five-year-old or put up a little bit of a fight or something? Yeah, and some people mention, you know, Georgia Tan, the baby brokers and everything, but it's pretty random to pick a small, you know, farmhouse out in the country in Wisconsin. I mean, I think she would, like, pull up to playgrounds and grab kids that way. That's it right. wasn't well-thought-out, planned execution, you know. That's right. Or going into a maternity ward, as we know, even happens to this day where yeah. somebody, usually a woman, goes in there and just kind of wanders in and takes a baby. Some, and sometimes they get away with it. And so. the speculation is that Jeannie was taken to go live with her birth father if that was not Raymond. So if that's the case, then, you know, I could see. But I'm, I don't see the grandma starting the fire. You're not going to start a fire with your husband up there you know i mean unless you, you want him dead which she didn't she rescued him so yeah that's that's the tough part about this right uh if we're going to think about this as some sort of planned abduction then the fire had to do something it had something to do with it i mean that sounds pretty desperate uh you know you know burning down your house so as to allow a, a girl to be kidnapped i mean what kind of money are we talking about here? Yeah, and that's another thing the, the the siblings claim because one mentioned they had no life insurance. I mean, no no house insurance or no, but they mentioned that they had more money afterwards. This is what the kids are saying. Said the mom got a got a fur coat. They seemed to be better off financially. With no explanation. Yeah, and I mean the the truck drivers union collected, you know. Like it said, two hundred and fifty dollars. So they're not going to get rich on that with seven people to no. to feed. Right. That's I don't know. That might be four thousand dollars. So then people something. then people wonder. Okay, was she sold? Maybe they purposely did all this. You know. Mm -hmm. 
It's just it very well may be, but we look at the opposite side of this. You really have to burn down your house to sell a child. Uh, of yeah. course, we, we, we know parents, uh, no more than myself, have talked more about how sex trafficking, it all starts with parents and parents getting their kids into this stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But you just couldn't say, well, I don't know. We were just here one day and she ran off into the woods and never came back. I mean, and then you get to keep your house and everything yeah. and you get the money too. Yeah. And some of the speculation was that when Jeannie was outside, she took off out of fear, mm -hmm. but I think she just never came back. So then they said, oh, okay, well, she must have been. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Let's move on. So planned abduction, it seems, I, I will have to say, it doesn't seem likely just the house part of it. We could believe maybe some other circumstance, but burning down your house to make it happen, that seems like pretty extravagant. Yeah. Let's move into this. Uh, and this is something that I brought up. I don't know if you touched upon this in your the blog that you wrote uh, regarding uh, Jeannie's disappearance, but some sort of she died in the house and they wanted to cover it up. Something that might get a parent in trouble or, you know, abuse or, or something like that. Uh, have you thought about this? Any insight into that possibility? No, it's just strange to me that there's no talk of the f actual fire, how it started, even with Forrest and all his recollection. Mm -hmm. You know, it's he's just starting from the moment he's taken outside. Because wouldn't the kids have an idea of where the fire started? You'd think. Uh, we don't know how big the house is. How big could it have been? We, you know, we don't know. We don't have a, a picture of it, at least not at this point. And it had an upstairs and a basement, but yeah, I don't think it was a big house. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, de, you know, did the grand, uh, once again, theorizing, did the grandmother do something to Jeannie? Did she, uh, you know, you know, shaking, shaking her, she went, fell down some steps, she's going to get in trouble. So she yeah. goes to cover it all up and she makes sure she you know, gets the kids out, gets her husband out. And she yeah, I'd like to know where the ladder was. Was the ladder right. close by? Right, it sure is convenient. You know? Yeah, it sure, it surely is convenient. That's the part of this that if he really maybe was invited, he was, he was dressed and ready to go. Maybe. Yeah, it's hard to figure. And so we, uh, I'm open. I'm really. I have to admit, I'm more open to that idea of cover up of her death, uh, some sort of abuse that was going on, and an effort to cover up that way. And somebody might be willing to burn their house down uh, if um, if they think it's going to mean they don't go to jail. So I'm curious if if Jeannie was treated any differently than the other ones. Like if there was a question about her father. I mean, I'm just curious if she was treated. As the, the same as the other siblings. Right, right. And then let's just go with the simplest answer. She really did die in the fo uh, fire, then, but then we have to try to figure out, well, what exactly was Forrest saying here? Uh, does this mean that Jeannie went back into the fire? But then that contradicts what the, the grandmother said. She's off with relatives. So, yeah. you know, uh, what about she died in the fire? Uh, pluses and minuses of that. What do you think? Oh, I think it's definitely possible considering it was, you know, 1949. Yeah. Nowadays, they would have gotten every single piece out of that house and tested it. But mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I think there's a very good chance that she could have died in the fire. It's just, mm -hmm. I mean, and maybe the grand, the grandmother, they said, always seemed to cover for the mother. So maybe that's why the grandmother doesn't seem, and you know, like, too sympathetic mm -hmm. towards Jeannie. Right. And the mother was kind of, they put out there that she'd have affairs and just kind of, and I don't know with him being a truck driver, if he was gone for long periods of time or, you know, was did local route. Mm -hmm. When the, um, uh, the cat's away, the mice will play maybe is what we're yeah. saying here. Maybe yeah, we also might. Sometimes she would leave in the morning after their dad would leave to go to work, their mom would leave and go places and they never knew where she'd go. Okay. Something that also comes to my mind is we're talking here. I mean, she could have died in the fire and it could still be suspicious. What, we, what if we'd find out that 
she was like locked in a closet. Maybe she was a bad girl yeah. or something. And maybe she was locked in a closet or handcuffed or chained up to some radiator in the basement or something. And that's the reason, you know, yeah. she, and that would all certainly be something that the grandmother and others would want to cover up. Certainly. Yeah. So it's certainly possible that the, the fire was totally accidental, but the fire would have exposed some sort of a child abuse or something. Yeah. I'm really, really open to that as well. What's interesting about this is that, like I said, we, Gerald Rustness and Peggy McKay, but you know who Tad Tobias is, Heather? He, he's the nobody he guy. Familiar. He's the nobody guy. He specializes He's a federal prosecutor, mm -hmm. I guess, retired or just a consultant now who uh, specializes in nobody cases. So, uh, some jurisdiction wants to bring a murder charge. He'll come in and look at the case for free and determine how it might be the best way to go about it. And when I interviewed him, man, it's been over seven years ago now, but one of the first ones that he looked at was something like this, where, um, some kids had gone, gone missing, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Uh, but he assisted in the prosecution and it was eventually determined that they just decided that all these kids died in a fire. Mm -hmm. So that was one of his first ones. So you start thinking maybe this happens more than we know, but it doesn't seem like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'll just give my impression. You give your impression, please. But we hear a lot about house fires and children dying in house fires just since i've been here in pennsylvania for a couple weeks seeing my dad it seems like it's happened a couple times here just in western pennsylvania but those kids are found you don't hear too many stories these days where fire happens child missing yeah and there's not even any any bones i mean what kind of fire could it have been that's going to incinerate bones immediately right that's right. And we've been through this before, like I said, with uh, Bernard Rustness and Peggy McKay um, in particular, that uh, you, it takes a long time and a very hot fire for this to happen, to burn a human body. But the thing is, we have to remember she's a, a little girl, yeah, 40 so there's pounds. not as much to burn. But uh, it doesn't seem like it would have burned hot and long enough. It seems like the fire was recognized pretty quickly yeah and it would have just and been it, a it didn't burn for days no, yeah, they would have mentioned that no whereas with bernard russis and peggy mckay the way i remember it, it did burn for a while before anybody really knew uh what was going on and we do know that their son did die in the fire so maybe it makes all the sense that they died too but once again mm -hmm. remains not found but it's really your impression it's the it's the contrasting stories right the 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 different stories is what makes it really puzzling right and and the grandmothers almost like disregard for genie you know most grandmothers would have went back in and got genie first and then went up and got the grandfather mm -hmm. right right it might be interesting. I mean, I'm not, I'm not here to give somebody else work. Maybe I could do this myself. Uh, maybe look up this uh, surviving member of the family who was 18 months at the time. Mm -hmm. I realize maybe she all just wants to put it behind her and everything, but it very well maybe maybe somebody like myself or somebody like you, Heather, who you know really has a good handle on disappearances. It very well may be that we can ask more pointed questions, more insightful questions than a regular investigator could ever do yeah you know what I, you know what i mean yeah mm -hmm. it, it, there, there might be something there so this is the disappearance anything else you want to say Th things that uh maybe have popped up heather uh that's just the the outline that i've been following if there's more that uh you want to talk about things that caught your eye regarding let's let's just talk about them right now please no i think it was just the mother and grandmother's behavior is what really kind of made these kids dig a little deeper mm -hmm. you know because it doesn't make sense to banish your children from mentioning their sister i mean the day that she seemingly dies so right. they weren't you know able to grieve properly and they probably always had to talk about her in secret if they did 
right uh any everyone... impression any impression uh, obviously what happens when they we heard about how she would drop them off in Minnesota and go off on her own. What kind of relationship did they have with her later in their life? I mean, if they got married, was she invited to the wedding? Any, any stories like that out there? There's no, there's really no mention in her later years. I know that Raymond and Opal both got remarried, you know, later to different people and, and passed away. But yeah, there's, there's so much of a lack of information and the fact that, you know, the only resource we would have had would be the police files. And they're gone. Now we literally only have newspaper articles to go on. Right. That's it. On newspapers.com or elsewhere. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Something also that comes through my goes through my mind. All this we're talking like the middle of the 20th century. But you know, we maybe think back to the 1800s when the families had um, a lot of kids. You know, they're on a farm. You need as many, mm-hmm. uh, you need as much cheap labor as possible. Yeah. And it would not, I don't think it would have been rare, rare in the 1800s if, you know, you have seven or eight kids and one of them dies somehow, they, everybody just keeps carrying on. There, there's really no mystery whether the kid died of an accident uh, out in the field somewhere or of a disease or something. I'm guessing people may be a little more resilient regarding that. Of course, they have seven more in contrast yeah. to these days where kids, you know, parents have a couple kids and it seems like. You know, you really got to watch each one of them. Yeah. So maybe, do you, do you maybe sense that could have been going on? They had so many kids that maybe if one of them disappears or dies in a fire, that it just didn't seem like a big deal to them? Yeah, it's almost like, oh, well, she's gone, you know, it's just because the grandmother and mother were trying to, you know, she's fine. She's. Mm-hmm. But I don't really know why the neighbor, I mean, I can't really see why she would make up a story. I, I don't either. I mean, of course, you know, as well as I do, people do make stuff up. Uh, yeah. you, you know, you've encountered that. I've encountered that. Many people who cover disappearances and murders uh, cover this stuff. But it does seem, you know, it's not just a crazy story, but it certainly doesn't make, if it was just a crazy story that doesn't make the grandmother look bad, then maybe something's going on. But it makes her look so bad that you almost have to believe it's true. Who would make something up yeah. that bad? And then also think she's 70. She's taking care of an invalid 80-year-old husband, and she's got three little children that she's watching all day, you know, every day. So, I mean, she probably couldn't watch them all the time because I'd like to know where the three kids were before the fire started. You know, right. why weren't they together? Because they would have all came out outside together. Right, and that goes back to something we talked out about it before is that, there's no story of the grandmother, despite her, all these stories of getting, you know, she's, I guess, bragging, I don't know, about getting her husband out of there. She never says, well, I last saw Jeannie in the basement. I last saw Jeannie yeah. in the kitchen, I, you know, or in her bedroom or something. Nothing like that. And, you know, the newspapers back then, they're almost entertaining with their headlines. But that was a big focus was the grandma rescuing the, the grandpa from the upstairs bedroom. It was the headline. No, it was. I saw it. Okay. Well, we'll leave that for uh, all the unfound listeners to look into it for themselves. Uh, Of course, burning, like I said, is not a new topic on this, but you have to look at each uh, disappearance uh, uniquely because we have to look at the kind of fire and who's actually missing and and try to make sense of of all of it. I'll be interested to see uh, how the audience reacts and what their impressions are. Let's now go to you, Heather. Of course, your blogger. And when did you start your blog? Lost and Found Blogs. Let's just make sure uh, make sure we name lostandfoundblogs.com. You started that it was, when? It was May, and I don't know if we're coming up on six years or seven. <laughs> the years are in together, right? <laughs> But yeah, so I, I think I've got like 34 articles on there. Good. Awesome. All right. So you started that and you got 30 or th- over 30 articles, disappearance, unsolved disappearance, some of which you've talked about on Unfound. But now you're doing a pod uh, podcast as well, recording uh, this. And so you've uh, joined the ranks of all the audio people out there like myself. What 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 caused that? What was it? Did something happen? Was there something that finally pushed you over to doing that? What was it? 
Yeah, pushing me is a good thing because I thought about it for a long time, but I, I don't have any knowledge about the recording part. It was kind of intimidating, but I thought, you know, I want more attention to the cases and I figured podcasts will do that. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm just transferring my articles into podcast form. And then I do re-research. I, you know, I'm able to add some things when possible. Like, as you guys know, Dale Kerstetter. Yeah. I spoke with his daughter on a podcast. People okay. got to hear her voice. Great. And then Mike West has done some analyzing of the footage with Dale and has a very interesting theory. So he spoke with me about that. So I, okay. every once in a while, I'll pull somebody in and, and talk with them. Okay. I plan on having Ed on there very soon to yeah. grill him. Great. Awesome. Fantastic. Uh, and so how many episodes are you into now? How often are these being published? What's, what's your pattern? I believe I've got 11 out there. And every other Sunday, I try to get one posted. Uh, okay. The the one last week was Charlotte Polis. I believe you've saw heard it. that. Yep. She saw just it. had her 30th anniversary of her disappearance. Yeah. So I got back in touch with Ali and kind of oh. got the updates on that case. Right. He was the guest way back uh, 2017. It must have been now some, somewhere in there. Paul Polis is still a free man. Yes. That's yes, he is. Uh, and uh, Unfound listeners haven't found that one yet. Go find it. Uh, where uh, it was. It, uh, that one will make you mad. <laughs> it will make you mad. Yes. It's what we now call, uh, although I wasn't calling it at the time, I call it now the man said type of disappearance. This guy says something in particular happened, but there are no scientific facts to back up all. It's just his word, and there's reason yeah. to doubt what the guy has said, yeah. for sure. Uh, what kind of uh, equipment are you using? Uh, who is uh, hosting your your podcast, what kind of setup do you are you doing for your audio show now? It's right now. It's just the um, Spotify for podcasters. Okay. They made it pretty easy. So it's just on the website. You can record from the website. Mm -hmm. I believe come June, they're going to make you stop. You've got to go on Riverside, I guess, and record oh. it that way. But so they so it's it's through Spotify. OK, me too. But I've kind of taught myself, you know, it's on it's on Amazon Music and Mm -hmm. you know, and a few other places. I've learned how to do that part at least. Mm -hmm. I'm not really good about editing, so it's kind of like stopping and starting over. <laughs> yeah, I got to say, I, I, yeah, nobody, I, I'm seven and a half years into this, nobody would want to see the behind the scenes of me recording my parts <laughs> of, nobody wants yeah. to, see, nobody wants to see that. Um, so I, are, do I you do, think, go ahead, go please, ahead. please. No, I, I do still love writing. And, you know, as you know, with the podcast, it involves a lot of writing. It does. So, I mean, I'm so, it's kind of the best of both worlds because I kind of, I like to bring attention, but I also think of myself as a storyteller because mm. I enjoy the writing part. So I'm kind of like, okay, I'm going to go and, and record it and I'm going to tell people a story, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think that you're uh, the way you're doing it right now? Are you going to wait until all of the ones that you've written first before you do like an original one that will just be like audio first? Or have you thought that far ahead yet? Well, I thought about doing uh, possibly Patreon in the future, and that would be a new one that I hadn't written about. Mm -hmm. But I'm also still wanting to do articles for the website. I won't yeah. be able to do them as much mm -hmm. because a lot of people you know, they, they enjoy that. They enjoy the reading. Yeah. You know, podcasts are huge, but some people still prefer do. the written word. Yeah, it's true. So I'm not, I'm, because I'll probably, you know, there's an article I'm thinking about writing coming up too. And, you know, then eventually I'll put it in podcast. So. Okay. All right. So you're using Spotify. They're going to make you go. I've heard this. I don't know. You know, it's weird. I had never heard this before. Uh, this Riverside, is that a program? What, what is that? I, I believe, and they want you to click on there that, so they must be partnering with Spotify and you can do video or audio. Okay. And as June, 2024, you pretty much have to stop recording on the Spotify for podcasters. Website. Okay. All right. Because I'd never heard of it before. And then earlier today, I was talking to Jeff Wise, who's the flight 370 guy, and he's going to be interviewing me for his podcast tomorrow. He brought it up. And I was like, I never heard it used of the to board. Be called Anchor, I believe. I've heard of Anchor. 
but I've never and used I think that they anchor. bought it and they thought if I probably bought it and changed it. Oh, that anchor.fm or something. I maybe remember yeah. it one time. All right. Okay. So used to, Oh, maybe that is then, but it's just weird. I'd never heard it before. And of course this is what yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. And then twice within the same day, well, it comes out. I know I was like, we're not professionals on? like you. We have to oh. get these user friendly websites. Oh, behave. <laughs> oh, behave. Well, that's interesting because as everybody knows, I'm hooked up with Spotify as well, but I use megaphone. You know, I just make my own files. Yeah. And then like right on my Mac computer and then I upload them. You know, and I you don't actually use any of their software. And you, and you drag them into the base and then you can preview them. But they also have an app that's interesting and it will show me how many plays on each. Yeah. You know, like the top right. 10, the amount of plays, yes. how many followers I have on Spotify. Things. Right. That's right. Right. Well, yeah. Whereas I've uh, been with Megaphone, what, two years now, which is like the advertising arm of Spotify. They're together. And so I just make my own files like I've always had since the beginning, even when I was with Podomatic and yeah. then send the file to Megaphone and put in where the ads are going to play. And but that's oh, all. Yeah. So that's something a little bit different. Yeah, a little bit different. OK, well, I have a, I have a case. I'm not sure whether it'll be a a podcast or an article, but I found a really, really bizarre case from Canada that mm. even Robin Warder had never heard of that's from Canada. So okay. I definitely want to bring attention because it's, you guys are just not going to even believe how okay. this person okay. went missing. All <laughs> so, right. Is it still unsolved? Yes. It yes. is. All right. Fantastic. Well, don't tell me yet. I, I want to yeah. Maybe I already know about it already, but it's nothing's ringing a bell because uh, mm -hmm. at this point I've covered some disappearances in Canada, but I don't, I don't know if any of them necessarily, you know, I've covered the, the six boys that went missing on Lake Erie mm -hmm. from Pickering. Yeah. I covered that one. And that's kind of strange, um, but this might not be something that I've covered yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. That's, uh, that's uh, interesting. What about, I need, I uh, should ask you this. What about like recent events? Do you really follow like, like this recent um, with Riley strain, who goes missing. Do you really get into following these like kind of news stories like daily or I really don't do much of that. So I'm going to ask you, what, what do you do regarding that? Yeah, a little bit. Or if there's a missing case, sometimes I'll just take a screenshot of the names and then I'll like look it up in a week or two, just, you know, to see if, there's been any resolution, mm -hmm. but yeah, Riley Strain. Yeah, that's that reminds me of other cases that we've heard about. For sure. Ask For sure. and what's what's the one from Ohio? The very well known where they they see him go in, but they never see him. Ryan Schaefer. Yeah. Yeah. That remind, reminded me of that. Right, and we've covered some. I mean, if you don't know Riley Strain, he was found deceased, yeah, like eight water. miles down river, and we've covered quite a few like that. Where I personally believe the people did go. In, into the river but I, I wanted to ask you that because you know like my assistant Shree, she's the one that kind of keeps me in tune with what's going on you know on yeah. a daily basis do you watch uh court tv ever is that or anything no, like and, that? and my my interest is more you know the older cases mm -hmm. but yeah definitely the the you know the ones that are really bizarre and i watch um uh, Adventures with Purpose. I know you're probably a big fan. Yeah, but I don't know what's that. Yeah. stories are interesting to me. Yeah. I haven't heard of a lot of the stories. Yeah. But sometimes uh, I'll, I'll research those. Yeah, I mean, I know, of course, we know about the one guy from Adventures with Purpose and the problems he's had uh, with some things going on in the last couple yeah. weeks. But uh, the, the listeners know that it's never anything personal against any particular. You know, I read your blog. It, but really, when I'm not doing Unfound, I really don't tune into any, uh, you know, true crime stuff. It's I'm so involved in my own stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm when I'm not doing this, I'm off doing other things. Yeah. So you need you need some light stuff. You can't be with yeah. this twenty four seven. You gotta have yeah. some light stuff going on. Yeah. But I I I, I don't know. Am I uh, unusual or something? I know that there are other hosts and bloggers who you know, really take an interest in what other people are writing or recording or whatever else. Uh, I'm not saying either way is right or wrong. It's just never been uh, yeah. my my thing, maybe. I don't know. Although for the, the show I do on Unfound Live, I do have to kind of keep up on recent events because I do talk about yeah. some of the things on there. Okay. 
Well, Heather, why don't you give out uh, where you can find your blog, where you can find your podcast, uh, every social media. Why don't you give it out all right now? Okay. Well, actually, on my blog website, my last five podcasts are actually listed on there. So that's okay. an easy way to get to them. Great. So it's Lost and Found Blogs, L-O-S-T-N-F-O-U-N-D-B-L-O-G-S. I have Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Okay. And the podcast, of course, there's other podcasts called Lost and Found, so I couldn't just get that. So mm -hmm. it's Lost and Found Podcast, one word. So I've got it on Apple. I've got it on um, Spotify, Amazon Music, and iHeartRadio as well. Right, great. Okay. But like I said, my website's the quickest way to get to the, the last. Right. The, the builder let me put the last, the most five recent episodes. Okay. RSS feeds on there. So. And yes, if you listen, of course, to her podcast on Spotify or Apple, or whatever, please give her podcast a five-star review. Please, please do that for Heather. Okay. And I got to think of the perfect case to chat with Ed about too, to put him on the hot seat. Is this going to be one that I've already covered or, or, or what? I, I don't know. Well, probably not if I can help it. All right. Well, you at least give me a thought. I, I don't mind going into things cold sometimes because you never know. That's where the create creativity comes from. Yeah. But uh, as as people usually find out, sometimes they know that all they do are disappearances, and I've done all these things. They just think that well, I just know everything about everyone, <laughs> and I don't. I really usually it's it's either one of two things. I know the name, but I don't know the circumstances. Yeah. Or like my goal with, is to find cases that no one has ever heard of. Yeah. So newspapers.com, sometimes you just kind of stumble upon yeah, articles. Do. Right. Or with, like with genies, I know the circumstances, but I don't know the name. I just remember, like I said, when we started, I recognized, well, a pretty woman and a pretty woman in a car pulled up. I remembered that, but I wouldn't have been able to tell you the year or anything else. Yeah. So it kind of my mind either works one way or the other. But yeah, I'm ready to come on, always ready to discuss. And I don't mind being put on the hot seat, like <laughs> maybe once a year, maybe once a year. <laughs> That's true. You but, come on my once a year now. Uh, okay, great. Well, that's it's a date. And uh, Heather, thank you uh, once again. Uh, sixth time uh, being on Unfound. Thank you. I'm honored as always. All right. Well, thanks. And you're welcome. And that was my March 23rd, 2024 interview with Heather Grotman, blogger and now podcaster at lostandfoundblogs.com. I thank her for joining me and all of you for the sixth time. And yes, I know, the name of the missing boy in New Jersey is Mark Heimbaugh, not David Heimbaugh. I apologize for the mistake. So, what to think about all of this? What makes all of this so hard to analyze is the five-year-old story does not give us a lot of theorizing room. What do I mean? Well, we could hypothesize that the grandmother harmed Jeannie somehow, and the fire was the way to cover it up. Except the five-year-old says he and Jeannie were out in the yard while the house was burning. We could theorize that actually Opal, the mother, took Jeannie that day to sell her to another family, and the fire was a plan between the mother and grandmother to cover up the sale. Except, the five-year-old says he and Jeannie were out in the yard while the house was burning. We could even guess that Jeannie died in the fire by accident, and you know where I'm going with this, except... The five-year-old says he and Jeannie were out in the yard while the house was burning. Like I said, his story completely paints us into a corner. It leaves only the following ideas. Yes, the pretty woman in the fancy car really did snatch Jeannie. Or, Jeannie ran back into the house after the boy ran to the neighbor's place. Or, Jeannie, for some reason, ran off on her own, never to be found. I got to tell you, I really don't like any of those choices. Then we have the neighbor telling the bizarre accounts of what the grandmother was saying, which also, in a way, 
doesn't give us a lot of room to think the grandmother didn't have something to do with Jeannie's disappearance. Collecting food cans, saved her husband all by herself, wanted to make sure she got her fur coat. What? I will tell you this, though. My imagination is really stretched by the idea that the grandmother was scavenging in the kitchen as the house burned. Sure, if it were some Beverly Hills mansion, I could see it. The kitchen could be a hundred feet away from the fire in a house like that. But how big was the Bryant home? My guess is not very big. Meaning if one room were on fire, that would affect every single square foot of the house in some way. And the grandmother is just hanging out in the kitchen. I also can't figure out how the grandmother managed to save her husband, save the kids who survived, then also had any time to go back in and scrounge for anything. So I doubt the neighbor's version of what the grandmother said, if the grandmother said anything at all. Meaning I'm completely throwing out everything the neighbor said, except for the fact that the boy ran down to her house. I think this would then explain why the son and his grandmother never took the time to resolve their different accounts because there weren't different accounts. To the public, there only appeared to be divergent accounts due to the neighbor infusing herself into the situation. That's the best I can do under the circumstances 75 years later. And none of this even touches upon how the kids once becoming adults, became suspicious of their mother due to her words, her actions, and her absences. Was this paranoia on their part, or was it something substantial? Hard to tell, but I'm not a parent. So maybe many of you with children can make sense of these stories. If you'd like to hear and read more of my in-depth analysis into the disappearance of Jeannie Bryant, please go to patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast, sign up, and partake in the unfound blog. You're going to find it entertaining, and you're going to learn a lot. Until then, I leave the public theorizing up to you. And that's the program. Right now, while you are in your podcast platform, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, wherever, give Unfound a five-star review, a thumbs up, whatever that platform allows. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Denzel, and you've just finished this episode of Unfound.